Just tell me a bit about yourself. Like, what were you doing uh, before you volunteered uh, to go overseas? Before I volunteered to go overseas, uh, I'd been a member of the Canadian Grenadier Guards for several years. Um, that was mainly what I was doing. I was uh, I was doing a lot of Class A and occasionally Class B work um, with the regiment. Um, I was on sabbatical more or less from university at the time and uh, I was I was living in Montreal where the Canadian Grenadier Guards are based. So why did you uh, why did you volunteer to go overseas? I wanted to kind of put into practice the things that I've been learning and training. Um, I was interested in in um, seeing more of the world and uh, I figured that uh, I figured that basically being a member of the uh, a member of the military, it, uh, I needed to deploy in order to have the full experience. I'm just going to start again because I need to lower the camera. What were you doing? In uh, what were you doing before you volunteered to go overseas? What kind of what's uh, what stage of your life were you at then? At that point, I was uh, I was in my mid twenties. I was living in Montreal. I was a member of the unit, the Canadian Grenadier Guards. I was doing a lot of um, Class A and Class B work with the regiment, and um, and then they called for volunteers to go overseas, and so I put my name in. So why? Why did you volunteer at that time? I thought that in order to have the the fullest experience of being uh, in the military, then that for me that meant deploying. So I figured that if I was, if I was going to be in, then I was going to, going to need to go somewhere in order to, in order to have the richest experience of, uh, of being a member. Were there, were there a lot of uh, your peers that were volunteering at the same time? There were quite a few. Um, certainly more people volunteered, as I recall, than there were spots to go. So, um, so there was a lot of interest in the regiment. Mm -hmm. What about, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it peer pressure, but was there a lot of, you know, I don't know, private to private, corporal to corporal, kind of like, I'm going, are you coming? What was, what was the mood at the time, like in the, in the junior ranks mess? There were a lot of conversations like that. And, um, you know, did you hear the, uh, you know, they're, they've just opened up, um, more spots and are you going to go? I think I might. What about you? I think so. You know, or no, I can't. Uh, my, you know, my wife won't let me, my girlfriend won't let me. I'm too close to being done school, things like that. So, um, just speaking of wives, girlfriends, what did your family and friends say, uh, to you when you told them that you had volunteered to go to Afghanistan or to go to, the, um, the Middle East? Um, my friends were, uh, my friends were mostly from the, the regiment and um, they, were, they were interested, they were keen. Um, some of my good friends were actually volunteering to go uh, on the same tour as me and were selected. And so some of us, some of us all went together, which, uh, which was a nice experience. Um, my family was more cautious about, uh, about the prospect of me deploying, but um, they understood also that, uh, that I wasn't going to Afghanistan so I think they were somewhat reassured by that. So at the time you volunteered, you, you knew you were volunteering to go to Camp Mirage? As a matter of fact, when, uh, when I volunteered, and myself and my peers, we were um, supposed to go to Operation Palladium, if I remember correctly, but it was Bosnia at any rate. Um, but, um, and that was our understanding for most of the pre-training. But uh, as the pre-deployment training was drawing to, to a close, um, word came down that there were going to be fewer people needed for Bosnia than was originally thought. So um, a portion of our original number uh, would not be going, um, but would be, offered, would be offered work, I believe, at Valcarce, which is where we were training, if they so desired. Um, another, another portion were still going to go to Bosnia, as per the plan, and uh, the remainder, we were being asked to go to the United Arab Emirates. 
So, um, so the destination ended up changing, but, um, but we were asked because it was not where we were originally slated to go. It was, um, the question was put to us, would you be all right with going to the United Arab Emirates instead? And, um, we were told if, if you want to go to Bosnia still, if, if that's the, if that's the place you want to go instead of the UAE, then we will arrange it so that you do still go to Bosnia. But in the end, all of us, um, who were approached about going to the UAE agreed to go to the UAE. Yeah. So what did you think at the time when you had this, this choice of those locations? Well, um, we heard that, uh, Bosnia was, was winding down. The mission there was slowly closing up shop. Um, so it seemed as if the, the more interesting thing might be to go to the UAE. Um, some of us didn't know where it was, uh, when it was said, uh, okay, you're going, you're going, or you may be going to, um, the United Arab Emirates. Some of us said, where's that, you know, and, um, we didn't know at the time, not all of us, that it was basically right next to Saudi Arabia, um, or that it was the place where Dubai was. Pretty much everyone had heard of Dubai. Um, but uh, it took a little bit of adjustment. Some of us, we, uh, we had to think about it for a day or two before agreeing to go, but, um, but uh, I don't think any of us seriously considered not going to the UAE instead. Tell me about your, uh, take a step back, or tell me about your workup training uh, with the Vandus. What, what were you doing? What kinds of things and for how long? Uh, yes, sir. We were at, uh, at Canadian Forces Base Valcarce, and our group was um, a D Company with the 1st Battalion, Royal 22nd Regiment. Um, Royal Bien Deuxième Regiment, I should say. At, um, we were there for eight months. Um, there was there was fighting in built-up areas training. Um, there was landmines training. I think um, I think that was not as developed at the time as it was later on in the uh, in the mission to Afghanistan. Um, See, I think I remember convoy ops. This is going back a while at this point, but um, there was a, there was a lot of PT, um, and we had we had field exercises. Some of them lasting for some of them lasting for two or three weeks at a time. So you, just so I can be clear, so you said you're part of D Company, or were you like a reserve company that was going? Um, we were a reserve company originally. It was. Um, we were D company, but, um, I think that we were, I think it was, it was a company of only reservists. The, uh, the term for it was, um, the CEMR. May I speak in French, uh, periodically, like just, uh, in order to use the terms that were not um, make it exotic. Sure. But you like but, a crick, like a composite reserve infantry company. Is that? Yeah. Well, the, the, Hang on, Compagnie Mixed uh, Infanterie Reserve. I'm probably dropping an article or something like that there, but it was like basically a mixed company of reserve infantry. Okay. So that's that's what D Company was. And I don't think we had any. I don't think we had any rake force members in it. It was just um, it was just D Company was was this reserve mixed infantry company which was originally supposed to deploy en masse to. Uh, to Bosnia until, as I said, the end of the, of the pre-training drew near and they decided that, um, that we were going to be split. So again, just to clarify, so of that company of reservists, yes. how many of you went to Mirage? About a third. Okay. So all platoons worth? Basically. Yes, sir. Okay. We were in a, um, uh, a defense and security platoon. Okay. So what did you, um, you said earlier, right? Some guys didn't know where the UAE uh, is. Um, what, what were your expectations? What did you think you were getting into? Well, 
Well, I myself, uh, when I, you know, I knew that it was on, I knew it was on the Persian Gulf. I knew that it was um, uh, a country that uh, that in large part made its money from from selling oil. Um, my feeling was that it was going to be something like uh, like Saudi Arabia, and it is it is right next door, and they are they do definitely have their similarities. Um, I figured there would be there would be sand, there would be heat, and there would be um, probably a lot of uh, a lot of expensive infrastructure and maybe shiny cars, and those things were all there. So, given that most of your pre training was focused on Bosnia. Did you do any mission specific training to get you ready like culturally or linguistically for uh, going to dubai there was um, there was a cultural briefing when we got on the ground in Camp Mirage as a matter of fact, I think there were two days worth of uh, of briefings um, where we were told like how to how to interact with the locals actually for the most part we were told to limit our interactions with the locals, I, I think, or at least we were told that there was, um, the locals might not want to in, engage with us at all, and that if that was the case, then we should, we should not engage with them either. So, um, but yeah, there were two days of, of uh, cultural and kind of like host nation briefing by, by Canadian Forces personnel um, when we got to Camp Mirage. I'm, I'm not sure how much there was before we went, uh, before we left CFB Belcarje. I think there was, but um, I'm not sure. And are you, uh, I'm just curious, like in terms of the language, are you, uh, is, is the language uh, for the deployment, is it French? Yes, it was the uh, the language of the pre-deployment training and the uh, the deployment itself. Um, the language of work was French. Um, at Belcarche, not surprisingly, like French was was omnipresent. It was everywhere. Um, once we once we got to Mirage, then it was our platoon that spoke French. Um, but the rest of the the rest of Camp Mirage uh, was four hundred odd. Canadian Forces members who mostly spoke English. So it became the, the sort of the Francophone experience of the tour at that point uh, became somewhat diluted, but it, it had been extremely Francophone while we were on um, pre-deployment training at Val. Okay. Um, just a last question about sort of before we talk in detail about Mirage itself. Once you're, once you got reoriented and you're going to Mirage now and you're but before you hit the ground, what were you personally hoping for from this tour? What did you hope it would be for you personally? Well, most of all, I hope that we would all come back safe and sound. Um, it seemed it seemed likely that we would, being as how the uh, the camp was in a basically a, a country at peace. So it wasn't, it wasn't like an outpost in the middle of a war zone. Um, other than that, I, I was hoping that we were going to have um, just a, a good experience uh, as, as a platoon and um, as a section. But uh, at that point, we'd already been working and uh, living together for eight months. And I knew that we had, we had a really good section. Like, exceptionally good members of other sections um, told us that uh, that they saw how well we got along so um, so there wasn't really a question about uh, about how the how the kind of interpersonal or co-working experience was going to be and besides that I was I was looking forward to feeling useful um, on, a, on a deployment and uh, also seeing some more of the world and making some money. So those all seemed like things that were likely to happen and they did. Um, and the, 
the francophone um, aspect that was that was really interesting actually. Um, I don't know if you'd like me to go on a little bit about that, but uh, yeah. And just one thing, don't don't call me sir. Okay. You don't, you don't need to refer to me at all. Just just tell your story. Okay. But uh, we'll get to the francophone part. But how about you just tell me your first impressions when you hit the ground, when you finally get over there? Like, how did you how did you travel to get there, and what were your first impressions when you finally got to Mirage? Okay, we flew from the airport at uh, Quebec City via Canadian Forces Airbus. Um, through Zagreb, and uh, I think that was our one stop, and then we, um, and then on to on to Camp Mirage, um, which itself is an airbase. It's co-located with an airbase. That's the reason. That's the reason for being of Camp Mirage. It's the staging point where basically larger aircraft would fly in and offload uh, people and equipment, generally troops and equipment, and then these would be loaded onto smaller aircraft. That were better suited for flying into um, into a theater of operations, namely Hercules aircraft. Um, so the flight, I seem to recall, it was it was a good twenty four hours that we were on route, uh, something like that. And um, most of us didn't really sleep. Uh, they fed us an inordinate number of box lunches, I guess, to uh, to keep us happy. It may not have been box lunches. They might have been actual, more like Canadian Forces airplane food. I'm, I don't recall. But anyway, they fed us a lot. Um, and then we, we landed. It, was, uh, it had been cold January when we left Quebec City. And then we got on the ground and it was, uh, uh, we were hit with, um, with this wave of, of hot humidity as soon as the aircraft door opened. Um, but it was only about 25 degrees at that point, and it was going to get much, much hotter than that. Um, I remember we were walking off the tarmac. Uh, I forgot my laptop on the, the airplane briefly because I was sleep deprived. Um, I got it back, and we were, we were walking into, into the camp, like off the flight line and into the camp, and um, we encountered the first people who had kind of gone on the, I don't know, the I guess advance party um, from our platoon, and uh, one of them uh, saw us coming, and she said, "Welcome to paradise." And uh, and it did kind of seem like that. There were there were palm trees, uh, there was a lot of sand, and um, and it was it was a a good level of hot at that point. What? Um, how was how was Mirage itself? What was the setup there? In terms of just like what was the layout for the Canadian footprint? Do you recall that? I do. There were there were two sides to the camp, which um, which was in a larger base. Um, but the the camp was kind of like a like the core, or um, of that base, and uh, there was there was a road that uh, that bisected the camp. It went down the middle, and on the one side of the road was um, was the the airfield itself, and also hangars and other operations buildings. And across the road was the accommodation side, so all the shacks, um, all the barracks, and the truly excellent dining hall. Um, and then dotted around the, uh, well, I guess in the in the corners of the of the camp, it was roughly rectangular. I think um, there were towers basically made of Hesco bastions and sandbags and timber. I think, um, which were basically defensive positions in case we in case we needed them. So, just speaking of the defensive positions, what was what were you told? the threat was at the time? Well, there were two vehicle checkpoints on the camp, which, uh, which we manned. Um, I 
Well, let me back up a second. There were, there were two gates and there was also a vehicle checkpoint which was uh, outside of, um, of both of those gates. Any vehicle that was going to come in to the camp or wanted, wanted to gain entry to the camp, it had to pass through the VCP first and we would search it. So it, was, it, was, it seemed clear to us that um, if there was going to be a threat to the camp, it was go going to be vehicle borne, most likely. Um, because otherwise the 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 camp and the the base in which the camp was was kind of in the middle of nowhere like just just desert extending out in in a for a long way in in every direction and maybe just a little bit of um of high ground in some places behind which somebody might be able to sneak up on the base and on the camp but um but otherwise it was really it was really out in the out in the open and far from anything. So, uh, it it seemed likely that if anything was going to, if any kind of attack was going to happen, then it would be it would be vehicle borne. And I'm just curious. Do you know had there been any uh, attacks like prior to your tour? Had there been any incidences incidents? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Against Camp Mirage. Yeah. Not no. Not to my knowledge. How um, how busy was it? Like, you know, in terms of tr flights coming in, people staying overnight, getting their weapons, heading off, coming back from Afghanistan. Uh, there would be, I think, a couple of flights a day. Generally, um, sometimes it would be, sometimes the aircraft that would come in would be the Antonov. I think an AN one twenty four. Uh, so largest largest cargo aircraft or aircraft period in the world I think um, but um, the the airbase was not it was not busy all the time there were not flights uh, coming in and out all the time um, but uh, but um, but the base was busy though I mean there were something like 400 personnel, um, 400 Canadian Forces personnel, as well as a, um, a smaller number of Australians and a uh, smaller number again of New Zealanders um, who were also conducting flight operations out of, uh, out of that same air base. Um, but, um, but there were a lot of uh, Third country nationals, I believe, was the term, who were uh, employed on the base and doing things like um, cleaning, housekeeping, um, landscaping. There was a there was a small camp of uh, again, I think, third country nationals is the term, who were um, outside the camp but inside the base, the larger base, and they were only a few hundred meters down the road from. Um, from the gates of Camp Mirage, so there was a um, there was a good deal of coming and going. Um, third country nationals had to be uh, we had to wand them. We had uh, basically metal detecting um, wands. You can you know the kind that I'm I mean basically just, uh, just portable metal detectors that you that you wave over the over the person in order to. Um, make sure that they're not carrying anything. Um, so, so there was that. It was uh, basically the mornings and the the mornings and the evenings, uh, the beginning and start of the of the usual business day. There would be a lot of people flowing through the uh, through the gates, and we would be checking their identification, wanting them if they were third country nationals, um, letting vehicles through the gates as well after checking to see that they that they should be let through. This would be after they had gone through the VCP. Sometimes there would be several, several vehicles uh, stacked up waiting at the VCP uh, until, we could, until we could check them if they were, again, if they were not Canadian Forces vehicles then they would, and they had been off the, uh, off the camp, then they would have to be thoroughly checked. Yeah, so tell me a bit more about what your specific job and the people that you're with. What are you, what are you guys doing day to day? You, you touched on it right there with the, with the wanding people. Is there anything else that you uh, were responsible for doing? Uh, well, we were we were riflemen, basically. Um, 
we were certainly fulfilling a security task and we were um, remaining the, the two gates. The gates were on either side of the road that I, that I mentioned that kind of cut the, the camp in two. Um, manning that VCP as well. Uh, and there was also an, there was an observation post, which at first was, it looked over the flight line. It looked over the, basically the, the runway and the, um, the aircraft parking areas or the ramps. Um, eventually they gave us a, a, I think 30 foot tower that, uh, that we could look out from instead of just being, instead of just being down on the ground. Um, so we would look at the, we would look at the runway and, and the, the land beyond the runway, which there was a bit of high ground there. So there was, there was a bit of defilade behind it. So, but we had those four, we had those four places. We had the gates one and two, the VCP and the, the OP tower. Once in a while there would be, um, there would be a practice alert and, uh, and we would run out to defensive positions in these kind of like Hesco Bastion bunkers that I mentioned before. So aside from like your C7, what other weapons did you have, other weapons and equipment did you use? We had C6. <clears throat> I'm trying to remember if there were 203s. I think there were C9s as well. There was definitely C6 though. Did, did you have any uh, vehicles to do like, vehicle patrols in or any anti-armor weapons, anything like that? No vehicles. Um, I mean, there, there were vehicles on the camp, but uh, Canadian vehicles, but um, the ones that were allocated to us, no. Um, there may have been ones that, that we would have been able to borrow, but uh, we didn't have we didn't have vehicles in our possession as a matter of course. Mm -hmm. um, Anti-armor weapons, not that I recall. Certainly nothing that we certainly nothing that we like had out on a regular basis. Okay. Um, there was. And I don't know if this is. Uh, There was a greater security presence, like kind of forming the perimeter of the base as well. Who, and who comprised that? Uh, the host nation military. So there, I saw a couple of uh, I saw a couple of Humvees and um, a couple of fifty caliber machine guns. There may have been more. I don't know. The Soldiers themselves, I think, had M4s. Okay. Did you, um, what, so you had a platoon, a DNS platoon. Like what kind of shifts were you pulling? And how did you, how did you handle that with your 30 odd guys in your platoon? Uh, the shifts were 12 hours. I believe they were, um, 11 to 11, so 1100 to 2300 hours. And um, it would be, it would be one section on it at a time. Um, most of the, most of the positions would be manned with, uh, with two people at a time. So two people at gate one, another two people at gate two. Uh, two at the VCP, and in daylight hours there'd be one at the uh, at the observation post. But at night, night I believe it went. Uh, yeah, it would go to two people at the OP as well. But at night the VCP would be closed, I believe. So you're on duty for twelve, and then you basically get twenty four hours off because of three sections. Is that how the rotation would work? I think so. Um, the one of the sections would be a QRF, would be a quick reaction force. Okay. Yeah, I think it was the uh, the section that had um, that 
had just come off. Hang on, they have to sleep too. Anyway, um, one section was QRF, and then another section was um, was just off. So, and they had the opportunity to go into uh, go into Dubai. There was um, there were shuttle buses that ran from Camp Mirage into Dubai, operated by well, there was um, they were contracted out to to a local company, I think. Anyway, certainly the drivers were the drivers were third country nationals. They were um, not Canadian forces members, but anyway, so there would but it was it was a contract. So these 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 shuttle buses were requested by the Canadian forces, and they they ran regularly from Camp Mirage to locations in Dubai, for the most part, Dubai. You want to take another break and just get some more water. Sure. Um, did you want to say something? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, could we could we pause for a second there? Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious about. I mean, so it sounds like it's a very static job, a section on at a time, and and you know quite a rigid shift schedule. What what was that like? Like you know, one month, month after month, especially as it starts to get hot. hotter. Yeah. Um, it was all right. We had, uh, in addition to, to our 17 days off that we got in all in one, in one block, our HLTA, um, I think home leave time allowance was what it stood for. Um, we also had two, two times two day R and R, um, which basically that each time that we had an R and R, it kind of it, it melded into the the downtime that we already got, and so we we ended up having like several days off in a row, and that happened twice in addition to the uh, in addition to the seventeen days off of the HLTA. So that was okay, um, but uh, it did start to get hot by the end uh, by. Early July, when when we uh, returned to Canada, it was uh, it was forty eight, forty nine degrees Celsius in the shade. Um, that was just the that was just the thermometer. The um, the medics had uh, a device that measured what was called wet bulb wet globe wet bulb globe temperature, I think, um, which basically gave us a humid X reading as well. And it would be, it would be 78 degrees Celsius and would be like what the, you know, what, what feels like, it feels like 78 degrees Celsius. Um, so that was, uh, that was extremely hot. I mean, when we got on the ground in, in, in January to just didn't jump back for a second. I mean, we saw that, uh, every structure, no matter how small, including the little guard shacks, which were, not much bigger than a porta potty. They had an air conditioner, and um, speaking for myself, at least, I thought, "Wow, you know, that's luxury." But then, by the by the time summer actually hit, it was we understood that it was absolutely necessary. Um, you would walk outside um, out of the air conditioning and into the into the heat. It, by by July, it was like getting uh, hit in the face with a like with a sandbag doused in scalding water. Um, every time you went outside and you would, you'd be gasping right away. Um, so, you know, the heat started to get, uh, the heat started to get tiresome. Um, it was actually a very humid place. Uh, and the, like the thickest, wettest fog that I've ever seen, uh, I saw it there because we were only about 35, 40 kilometers from the, uh, from the coast of the Persian Gulf. So despite it being desert and despite it being very hot, it was also very humid. Um, and I guess almost at sea level too. So, so yeah, just a lot of humidity. Um, but for the most part, uh, uh, for the most part, it was all right. What are you, what are you wearing? You're on your 12 hour shift. How are you dressed? Uh, we would be wearing, uh, well, combats and, FFO, we would, um, I'm trying to remember how often we wore our helmets. I think that was only during alerts. Okay. 
But um, so we would have the tactical vest on, and um, then also during alerts we would we would have our um, we would have our our Kevlar vests with with plates. So, or rather our our frag vests with Kevlar plates. But um, but yeah, it was uh, it was combats all the time. Um, I don't think we were I don't think we were ever permitted to take off our shirts like our our combat over shirts those uh, those always had to stay on as well. But so for your twelve man shift, you're not wearing body armor for the whole for the shift. No, that was only if there was uh, if there was an alert, okay. which usually there wasn't. Usually there was usually armor was just within within arm's reach, but um, but not on. So what do you, um, when you're on the gate, what are, what are you looking for? What are you anticipating or, or searching people for? What do you, what, what's the threat? Well, certainly the threat that was uppermost in our minds was um, explosives. So if anyone were to have, um, if it were to be a person that had explosives on them, um, or if it were to be a, a vehicle that that was carrying explosives, and I do mean like a bomb, then um, those were the those were the things that we um, you know those are the those are the threats that captured the imagination the most. Although there would be there would be other ways that it would be possible for us to be attacked. Obviously, it doesn't take a it doesn't take a bomb necessarily, but. Um, uh, for people walking from, basically crossing from one gate to another, the two gates were, were almost inside of each other. I think there was, there were a couple trees in the way, um, but they were only about, they were not that far apart. They were less than, less than a minute's walk from one gate to the other, kind of across that, across the road and across the expanse of land, um, between the two gates. And the, we were in communication, um, Every every one of our positions, we had we had Motorola's, we had walkie-talkies, basically. So we would be talking from one position to the next, um, as much as needed. In addition to doing radio checks periodically, uh, and if one gate was sending a um, like a third country national, uh, like a kind of say one of these landscape workers who was originally from, say, Bangladesh or whatever, and was in the UAE on a work visa. There were, there were many um, third country nationals like that. So if, um, if one such person was leaving one of the gates, then it, you know, we would say, where are you going? Um, just routinely we would ask, where, what's your destination? And uh, if they said, well, I'm going, I want to go to the other side of the camp. I have to, I have work to do on the other side of the camp. Then, um, then the gate that was, the gate from which the person was, was leaving would call the other gate and say, I'm, I'm sending you, I'm sending you a third country national. Like this person is walking away from my gate and he's going to be at your gate in, in a few moments here. So, and then we would, Basically, one gate or the other would be able to see the individual um, for the for the entire walk from one gate to the other. So, the one gate would say, "Here comes uh, here comes somebody," and the other gate would say, "Okay, yes, I see your person." And then they would they would come through the other gate. What about um, it? Just occurred to me. Uh, I mean, it's a Muslim country. What about um, women searching women, wanding women? Was that an issue, uh, something you had to sort of do, handle delicately? I don't remember that ever coming up. Um, there were, there were few times that we actually had members of the, um, of the host nation come to the camp. Very few, as I recall. Um, so, so that wasn't an issue. And the third country nationals, again, many of them, they were largely from, say, the Indian subcontinent. So, um, so even though the UAE was a Muslim country, uh, the, 
the third country nationals, like the, the non-Canadian forces personnel that we would see, um, or that we would interact with on the camp, you know, that had employment on the camp, were not themselves members of the, of the host nation. They weren't citizens of the host nation. So I don't think, I don't think one of them was, um, I'm not remembering any women uh, among the third country nationals. So I don't know if, um, like we had, a, we had a couple of women in, in our number, in our platoon, in our defense and security platoon, who were women. So a couple of our soldiers were women. I don't recall whether, uh, whether any of the people that, you know, that, that needed to be searched or wanted, I don't recall if any of them ever balked at or protested against um, a woman doing it. That may have been, it may have just been that uh, the, the other person who would be on the gate, which would invariably be a, a guy, I think, would just do it, I suppose. And, and the men in your platoon weren't, you, you didn't see women, uh, you didn't see enough women or you never had to search like a, a third country national or like that? Okay. No, the, the only women that we saw on, the, on Camp Mirage were um, members of either the Canadian military or, um, or PSP, which I forget what that stands for, personnel support. Anyway, the kind of, I don't know. I don't know what PSP stands for, but basically they were the, they were people who were there to help. Like they were Canadian civilians more or less in the, in the employ of Department of National Defense who were there to do things like run the gym. Um, or like help plan travel for members for when they would go on uh, on their on their seventeen day leave. Is there a is there a day an incident that stands out for you uh, as being particularly memorable during your time there? Well, early in the uh, early in the deployment, um, I remember there was one day it was. Uh, we were, my section anyway, we were sleeping. We must have either been, I think it was because we had been on night shift. Um, it was that or maybe we were getting over, maybe we had just arrived and we were getting over jet lag. No, I think we were coming off of night shift, so we were sleeping. It was the middle of the day. Uh, specifically, it was, it, the clock struck 12 noon on, I think, a Saturday, um, maybe a Sunday, and all of a sudden this, this ear splitting alarm just like went up and um, and we all woke up instantly and uh, we were kind of wondering what to do and then we because this hadn't been this hadn't been discussed but it was an, it was an alarm definitely uh, and then we heard like go 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 grab and grab all your stuff and go get to your positions so that's what we we did we jumped into our jumped into our clothes and grabbed our um, our, our tactical vests and our helmets and we went, went swarming outside and just, uh, um, anyway, at some point it, uh, it turned out that there was, uh, this was a scheduled thing that happened every weekend, every either Saturday or Sunday at 12 noon, the base would test its alarm. This was the, um, this was the host nation that was like testing its, uh, its alarm system. So, um, so anyway, I don't, I don't know if some people, some people on Camp Mirage must have must have known it, but the word hadn't reached us. So, uh, so yeah, for for a few moments, um, it seemed like maybe we were under attack. But um, but I remember I remember as we ran that I was like, it's it's exactly twelve o'clock. This seems like it might be some kind of scheduled thing. So I don't recall whether we got um, whether we actually got uh, to the the armory and whether we were grabbing weapons. We certainly did that for other practice alerts that we had scheduled ourselves and that we knew was going to happen. But um, I don't recall if we actually grabbed uh, weapons from the lockup for, for this occasion before we were told, well, stand down, it's okay. Was that the, was that the most adrenaline 
You ever, uh, you got to experience on that tour? For me, yes. Um, there was another time that was, uh, it was, I'm trying to remember what exactly happened. I think uh, it wasn't something that had happened right close by or, or at, the, at the camp, but um, I think if I'm remembering correctly, uh, it was something that had happened in, uh, basically in Israel, uh, Israeli forces had, had uh, killed the spiritual leader of Hamas, I think. And so then there were there were threats against um, there were threats made against the West. Uh, I think there were like anonymous threats that were called into the uh, I think the U.S. embassy in Dubai. And so then it was decided that um, I don't remember if any were specifically made against uh, against the Canadian presence in the UAE, but um, but it was decided that we should be on lockdown for a few days. So basically, no more. Um, no getting off the, off the camp for a few days for anything other than non-duty, no, anything other than duty travel. So. How, how sensitive was uh, the existence of Mirage in, in Dubai in terms of what you were told you could do or not do and things to watch out for? Well, there were places we were forbidden to go. Uh, one of them was the the Hard Rock Cafe. We were told you all are not to go to the Hard Rock Cafe because it's a, it's obviously a magnet for um, for service members of the United States Armed Forces. So um, that seems like you know we were we were told this and it's it's too much of a potential target. And so so you all are not to go there. Um, I think there was another one or two places. Hard Rock Cafe is the one that stuck in our minds the most. Um, other than that, we were told to just attempt to keep a low profile, um, not to not to wear clothing that um, that suggested that we were military. I don't I don't mean like wearing, you know, I don't mean don't wear parts of your uniform, that goes without saying, but, um, you know, avoid, avoid wearing shirts that say like army or I don't know, any, anything else with like military slogans. Um, maybe even avoid wearing camouflage, I think, um, non-issue camouflage, avoid wearing that. Um, don't talk, don't talk shop. So don't discuss, don't discuss military things, whether, you know, or at least not your, not your own um, military experiences, um, whether or not they pertain directly to Camp Mirage, well, especially not if they pertain directly to the camp, but um, avoid, using, avoid using military lingo, avoid using acronyms, things like that. Try not to, maybe, maybe don't talk in terms of like, of military time if you're saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna meet you at, at um, at uh, you know the the gold sook, the gold marketplace. Maybe don't say I'm going to meet you there at 1800 hours. You know, maybe try saying 6 p.m. So, um, so that was that was it basically. I think for the most part, it wasn't too it wasn't too hard to tell who was who was military though. I mean, especially if we would be waiting for the be waiting for the shuttle bus or um, when the shuttle bus arrived then it would sometimes be like sitting there for a while while we were on it and I mean all these people with uh, you know haircuts of like one on the side two on the top you know these these clearly military haircuts um, so so we were told to keep a low profile as much as possible and we did as much as possible although I think in in many cases it would have been it would have been fairly clear, especially when we were standing in a gaggle or even when there was more than more than just a couple of us together, like just going out. Did that ever, did that ever make you nervous when you're waiting for the shuttle bus and you're all standing around in civvies looking like you're obviously Western soldiers? Any concerns that, at that time uh, for your safety? Some. 
I mean, we weren't we weren't told that we should be um, that we should be especially nervous, you know. But uh, I think we were I think we were all keeping an eye out when we were waiting for the bus to arrive, and um, and keeping an eye out too until the bus pulled away. Because as I said, sometimes it would it would wait there for a little while, and then we generally we would all be sitting on it waiting. So. So how did you feel? Like, what was it like uh, on your days off when you would go into Dubai, you know, as the sightsee or things like that? What was it like to be immersed in that Arab culture and, and the wealth of Dubai? Eye-opening. Um, there were, uh, I mean, we could see, we could see the, um, the Burj Al Arab, the... Um, I believe seven star hotel that uh, kind of stands on its own own little artificial island just just offshore um, and it looks like it's supposed to look like a sail kind of like the sail on a sailboat some people said that it uh, looks like a, a cockroach standing on its head but um, anyway that's that's the one I'm talking about and it was uh, you could you could see it from the camp um, just in the distance uh, so but there was a lot of a lot of wealth and a lot of opulence like that. Uh, there were a lot of, a lot of um, the kind of shiny fast cars that I had imagined would be there. I mean, they they weren't. Uh, they were certainly outnumbered by like by planer cars, but there was a there was a lot of money. Um, uh, at the time, I didn't know that. Um, that Dubai was built with a lot of a lot of labor from um, again basically third country nationals again largely I I think from the from the Indian subcontinent um, and those people we were those people that doesn't sound good but anyway the these these large numbers of third country nationals who had been uh, who had been used in the um, in the construction of of Dubai of all the infrastructure of the buildings of the roads and things like that um, they were we were we were told that they were housed in kind of like large areas which were far from anywhere the tourists would see and um, uh, we never saw them so we never saw the places where they lived anyway but um, uh, but it was yeah, there was a there was a lot of money that we did see, and um, like there were we heard about these desalination plants, which were used for basically turning the turning the the salty water of the Gulf into drinking water. Um, and there were, you know, there were systems for there was a lot of greenery. There was a, a lot of a lot of grass, uh, which was again we were told. Um, watered using gray water the the city apparently had this uh this system set up to capture all the all the gray water so everything that was used from basically the, the everything that drained from sinks or showers or washing machines i suppose uh, would be would be sent to to water the grass everywhere so um so yeah so there was a surprising amount of 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 grass, manicured grass in the city as well. Um, but uh, yeah, the, there were there were shopping centers that were that were that were very ritzy as well. Um, I never went inside the uh, I never went inside the the Burj, the hotel that was mentioned there, because it. It cost money to even take a tour, but uh, but one or two people from the camp uh, um, from Camp Mirage went. I think that we that we knew of, and they said it was astonishing. And the lobby was so t the lobby went all the way up to the well, it went all the way up, and apparently at the toward the top, sometimes clouds would form because so they had to figure out how to how to work around that. Supposedly everything that everything that looked like it might be gold was gold, not brass. So, but, um, but um, that was eye-opening. We were told that uh, if a, um, 
that the the smaller the number on a car's license plate, the more important was the person driving the car. So if you saw a car in, uh, whose license plate was in, in the single digits, then you knew that that was a very important person. For example, we saw some of those once in a great while. So, What was the, um, what was the alcohol policy while you were there? either at Mirage or when you went into, into town, into, into Dubai? Uh, Camp Mirage was, uh, it was dry. Um, and then in town, I think, uh, two drinks. And um, you mentioned earlier, you wanted to talk about the sort of the English-French uh, relations in the in the platoon, but sort of the culture. How did that? Well, what did you want to say about it? Just that it was uh, the the francophone aspect was was very interesting. Um, I was uh, fortunate to already have a good foundation in French. Um, I I went to French immersion schooling basically all through all through. Uh, primary and secondary school, um, and that was before I moved to Montreal. So, so I had the basically I, I had the ability to to partake in in the training in French and then to deploy in French because I I think there were there was at least one person that I know of who was who was in the pre deployment training, but then eventually had to had to be let go because they they didn't have the French to to basically operate and they hadn't they hadn't picked up enough of it to operate so but I mean uh, in the in the eight months that we were and this is this is coming back again to pre-deployment so this is at camp uh, nope this is at, uh, at Valcarche outside Quebec City um, by the by the end of the eight months I could Argue in French, tell jokes in French, you know, and effectively, like ones that ones that actually made made people laugh appropriately um, with me, not at me. And uh, um, I twice I dreamed in French that I remember. The entire dream was in French, and that was that was something else. So, so that was that was really interesting, and in that. Uh, like half my half of the members of my section were from the Saguenay, which is, which is, um, pretty far from Montreal. I mean, Quebec City is about three hundred kilometers north of Montreal, and then the Saguenay is about another three hundred kilometers north of Quebec City. So, um, so I mean, that was that was different again. Uh, we had to learn to we had to learn to understand each other when we when we spoke French sometimes, but. Um, but uh, but it worked, and um, it worked, and the uh, the the platoon got along well, even though it was. Uh, I mean, a large part of the large part of the platoon was uh, was Anglophone, was English speakers. Um, generally, from generally that would be reservists from Montreal, like myself. Um, but uh, but there was. There was good esprit de corps, and there was uh, there was good camaraderie. Um, Did that surprise you? No. Like, were you concerned about it before you deployed the language divide or issues? No. Okay. No, I figured it would be. I figured it would be fine for myself anyway. I knew there would be I knew there would be things to to pick up on, but I'd already done. Um, at least one course in French before uh, and that was it was a few years prior, but it was It was a I think a month-long course and it was entirely in French without any um, I think I got course materials in English if I wanted them like like written written materials in English if I wanted them and I figured that I figured that that could be probably arranged as well on uh, on the pre-deployment training, if need be, but um, I know it worked out well. Could you? Um, I mean, so it sounds like the the working language of that platoon was French. 
Yes, that's right. Even after on, on duty, could you speak English when you weren't on duty, or was that frowned upon? Um, no, that was fine. That was fine. I'm trying to remember. Uh, well, generally, if I mean, if we were if we were still in a group, then uh, I think we would, by and large, we would try and speak French, and even if we were if we were Anglophone, um, just so that just so that. That is, if there was if there was someone there who who maybe didn't speak much English, um, so we would we would try and make sure that everyone was included in the communication, even if it was uh, even if it was like outside of work and it was not really work related. Then we would still try and try and make sure that everyone was uh, able to understand. What about the uh, you mentioned the women? In your platoon, what about the male-female mix? Were there any issues uh, surrounding that? Mm, I don't think so. No, not that I can remember. So, by the end of your, uh, by the end of the tour, mm -hmm. how are you feeling about it? How how satisfying was it for you personally? It was satisfying. Um, I was glad to have done it uh, when when it was actually over. Then um, when it was actually over, then I felt kind of bereft. I guess uh, one of my one of my friends uh, that was. From my unit and who had deployed to Camarage um, with us, he he put it well. Um, I'm going to try and remember how how exactly he phrased it, but he said something like, "With tour ending, it's like losing your job, losing your apartment, and you know, and you know, having your relationship break up all at once." Um, and that that rang true for me, because uh, I mean, suddenly you know we had we had been over there, and we had been you know doing doing this job, filling this role for uh, for half a year. Um, the same you know the same group, um, and our section was a, a tight knit group, as I've mentioned before, um, and. Just being needed to being needed to fill this role, and then all of a sudden we were uh, we were back home and well back in back in Canada, and and none of that was there anymore. But um, but we were met at the airport by um, members of uh, basically well members of the senior leadership of our regiment. Speaking for myself, anyway, speaking for the members of the Canadian Grenadier Guards who were on the same flight as I was, so we were we were met by several members of senior leadership who had driven up from Montreal uh, just to shake our hands and welcome us back, and that was that was a nice touch. Um, and then we were then we were driven back down to uh, to Montreal in uh, in vans and. And we were brought wherever we wanted to go. I think for well, we still had we had all our kit, right? Everything that had gone with us, everything that hadn't um, been sent ahead as unaccompanied baggage, we we had all of that with us, which was still a considerable amount. So I think I think everyone wanted to go home. Um, so that's that's it. We all went home. And I let myself into my apartment, which I had kept. Um, all those, uh, yeah, which I kept all those months because I didn't want to have to deal with finding another one when I came back, and so uh, I let myself in, and it smelled like, well, it smelled like a place does when it hasn't had anyone living in it. It's just that kind of musty, dusty, unlived-in smell, and um, anyway, and then I was back, so. But um,
but it took some adjusting. I remember, uh, I remember being out with, uh, with a civilian friend, um, shortly, shortly after coming back, maybe a, a week or two after coming back. And, um, and I remember he was, uh, this one civ civilian friend was, maybe that sounds strange to say civilian friend, but anyway, it was somebody not from, somebody not from the military. Um, and he was bugging, uh, his other friend about, um, about the size of his cell phone because this was like 2004. And so anyway, cell phones were big. I don't know. Anyway, I didn't, I didn't have one yet. And anyway, I remember he was, he wouldn't, the one guy wouldn't stop like bugging the other guy about like how it's your phone is big like a dustbuster and I didn't I didn't think it was funny I mean I don't think it showed but I I, I thought it was I thought it was ridiculous and and that it was strange and aggravating the like petty things that people could care about I don't know I guess I was still in I guess I hadn't adjusted to being home yet because that, I mean, that wouldn't, I wouldn't bat an eye at that now, but I mean, it, I, I thought it was, I thought it was really, I thought it was very foolish and it, I was kind of quietly getting fed up just, just being present for that conversation. Did that surprise you that you're, those emotions that you're, that you were experiencing at that time? Kind of. Um, I remember feeling, uh, I remember feeling impatient, uh, kind of angrily impatient in a way that I'm, in a way that I almost never am. Uh, during the, the first few weeks when I was back, I remember trying to get, if I was riding the metro, like the, the subway in Montreal, um, that was fine. I didn't. Uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't bothered about being in crowded places or, or anything like that. Any of, any of the classic stories of, I don't know, that other people have said. I mean, I certainly didn't have a thing where I would be, a, where I would see like a bag of garbage on the ground and like, and wonder if it was really a bag of garbage. You know, I didn't, I didn't have that, but, um, or anything like it. I mean, I wasn't, we weren't. We weren't in Afghanistan, but um, but I mean, when people would like, when the metro would pull into a station and and it was my station and I wanted to get off, and uh, and people started like flooding onto the train from the platform before I had the chance to get off. Then I mean, uh, I, I really wanted to shove them out of the way, and I usually didn't have that feel, but I but I did for the first few weeks that I came back. It took me about a month to kind of feel like I was back. Um, other people too. Uh, we we saw some of the members of the section again when we we had to come back to Valcarche for um, out clearance. I, um, some kind of some kind of maybe out clearance is not the word, but anyway, we had to go back to Valcarche in, in order to kind of close out our deployment and. Um, so the members from the Saguenay, for example, we, we saw them all again, which was really great. We were really happy to see each other. Um, but um, but uh, one of them said, uh, he said to me when we were in the, in the mess uh, later that night, and said, you know, I, I feel this won't, be, this won't be a direct quote because it was, it's been a while and besides it was in French. Um, and I don't remember exactly what he said, but he said that he felt very, or unusually just kind of, he said he had this, basically he said that he had the same, same feeling like wanting to shove people out of the way if they were like trying to flood onto the, onto the metro car before he could get off. Not exactly because there's no metro in the Saguenay, but, um, but he said, and I don't know why that is. He said, I, I don't know. I wasn't expecting it. I'm surprised by it. I'm not sure what to make of it. And I said, well, maybe it's because we were over there, um, you know, for, for all these months, for these six months, kind of not, not necessarily, I 
you know, we probably weren't going to be called upon to uh, step directly into harm's way or to, or to harm anyone else. Uh, but it was a large part of uh, like the, the possibility that we might have to do so or be called upon to do so. That was a large part of why uh, we were there. So to have to have had that experience for half a year, I mean, I said, I guess it, I guess it kind of, it's affected us uh, for now. It's, I, I told him, I, I know what you mean, I, I told him the story, but like, about wanting to just, just wanting to get off the metro when it's my stop and, but, but after after about a month, I think for all of us, we were we were back. What about what about today? What about now? Do you uh, do you experience anything today that you would relate to to those experiences back then, two thousand four? Care to prompt me? No, I am just curious. I mean, do you, um, I mean, do you, do you still dream in French? Do you, oh, do you have? Do you dream about scenarios where you're on the gate and something happens, doesn't happen? I mean, that sort of lingering effects. No, I um, I didn't dream in French anymore when we uh, basically after we were out of Valcarche. I guess I just, I mean, once we were in Camp Mirage, we started. Those of us who were Anglophone anyway, we started speaking, well, we started speaking English to uh, all the Anglophones that came through our gates, right? I mean, naturally. So, um, so yeah, there was our, I don't know, probably, probably half of the, half of the talking that we did in, in any given day when we were at Camp Mirage was, was in English again. So, um, my, my, my best fluency at, at speaking French was, was in Belcarnier, so it like started to come down slowly a little bit after that. Um, and in terms of dreaming about, I'm not remembering any, any dreams from, from tour, actually. I don't remember dreaming uh, that I was on tour. It may have happened. It must have happened, but I'm I'm not I'm not remembering any. Okay. Um, what about um, so? Did you go to Cyprus for decompression, or did you just come straight back? Sounds like you just came straight back. We came straight back. Okay. Yeah, um, we we must have we must have landed somewhere. But well, I don't remember didn't where. Stop over anywhere, no. Okay. No, it would have been if we landed anywhere. It would have been, and I think we did. But um, it would have been a refueling stop, just like Zagreb was on the way there. Okay. Did you? Um, I'm just curious. Uh, after that experience, that that sense of purpose, the closeness with with your fellow uh, soldiers. Did Did you ever try to go overseas again, or did you ever think about going overseas again? different deployment? I thought about it, um, but I didn't. I didn't put my name in for uh, any overseas deployments after that. Uh, just, just uh, a domestic one, but um, Operation Podium in support of the, uh, the Winter Olympics in Vancouver in 2010. But um, I had university to get back to, um, and it seemed like spending another year and a half or more, probably between between pre-deployment and and deploying somewhere again. It it seemed like a lot of a lot of time, and I wanted to wanted to get on with the. Uh, with things civvy side. 
So when you look back at uh, that experience, uh, well, it's more than 10 years ago now, yeah. uh, how do you think it, it changed or affected you as a person and, and as a soldier? Could we pause for a moment? So maybe it did, maybe it didn't, but how did, how did that tour uh, affect you as a, as a person and, and as a soldier? Well, I was glad that I went. Um, while I was over, I decided that I was going to attempt to go back to university, which I had, which I had left um, several years before. And uh, I got in touch with the university while I was there and I said, look, I'd like to come back. And uh, they said, sure, just come back in the fall, as easy as that. So there weren't any hoops to jump through, and so I knew that I was going to be, I knew that I was going to be going back um, to studies when I returned, and that that helped as well. Um, gave me the sense that there was going to be something uh, worthwhile uh, and constructive that I was going to be doing when I came home, um, just to kind of help balance out the. Uh, the loss of of purpose and of um, camaraderie that I that I mentioned before, um, as I said, I mean, and I should I should have credited this. It was my it was my friend Dave. I don't know if he would want it, his last name used, so I guess that I won't. But uh, but he said, in the end of tour, it's it's like losing your job, losing your apartment, and and having your relationship break up all all at the same time so but um and and it uh, it affected me the fact that uh, i mean the life and death aspect of of having been over there and i i say this not not pretending that um, that there was a likelihood that we were going to end up being like troops in contact, um, but it was it was a possibility. It was it was possible, um, and also just in some of the some of the poverty that we saw there alongside the alongside the the colossal wealth too. I mean, these were. That was kind of it was a sobering thing. So I mean, those those things were those things made me kind of come back more um, in a more serious kind of frame of mind than um, than when we left. But um, I don't think about the tour much now anymore. But. Uh, But I, I still have, I still have uh, friends from from tour, especially from my section. Um, our section commander was, um, as I mentioned, he was he was very good at bringing the section together like a like a family, such that even when we were when we were off, when we had time off, we would like we would tend to go into town together and to Dubai together and we would tend to do things together and it wasn't I mean those who have been in the military are familiar with the concept of of forced fun where you're kind of told okay now you're all gonna now you're all gonna have a party and you're gonna and you're gonna enjoy yourselves but I mean this wasn't like that at all it was it was a it was quite a young section I was I was um, I was among the oldest members of the section and so was he uh, and he and I were about 25 26 and I think everyone else I think was uh, was somewhat younger than that but um, but it was it was like a family um, his name was uh, Pierre Olivier Roy um, if you were Anglo I guess you would you would think it was Roy Anyway, but uh, and he was uh, he was a member of the Regiment de Maisonneuve in Montreal, and he uh, just a couple months ago died uh, after a 
a long battle with cancer, so, but, um, but it's, it's largely thanks to uh, his influence that I still have, I still have friends, I think, that might not otherwise have been, they might not have been people that, that mattered as much to me, but we, we in that section, we were very close, so.